Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all of you that have joined from around the world on the Phase One Industrial Webinar. And today's webinar is Benefits of the Phase One Industrial Cameras and Helicopter Mounted Systems with Geo One. My name is Dana Brown. I am the Sales Director for the Americas. But before we begin, if you have some questions during this webinar and you'd like to ask them, please type it in the chat box and our moderator will read them to the panelists at the end of the presentation. I promise the opening part of this webinar will be short. It will be an overview for the phase one industrial uh, company and products. And then we'll follow that by our key partner, Geo One, and their multiple use cases of phase one cameras in different configurations mounted for helicopter use. One of those use cases will be expanded upon by a special guest from Geosim. It's about a 3D deliverable for one of the world's busier airports. So let's get started. Phase one began in the early 90s as a medium format camera provider for professional photographers. There's many conversations that can't be made without mentioning phase one in connection with medium format. They're almost synonymous. Phase one has since grown into multiple divisions that address needs of imagery in the industrial world. You'll see them on the screen with aerial imagery, and that would include mapping, inspection, change detection, monitoring, and surveillance, just to name a few. On the ground side for ground imagery of machine vision, mobile mapping, and cultural heritage. In addition to the hardware, we develop and maintain many software packages. This combination of domain experts, hardware and software provides a trusted solution from phase one for solving the world's problems in many markets. We are a global company. Our headquarters is located in Copenhagen. We have three R&D centers, Copenhagen, Israel, and Japan. In addition, we have sales offices uh, that support the global efforts in North America, Germany, and Hong Kong. Our North American office is located in Broomfield, Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Metro Airport, just north of Denver. It is an amazing, beautiful office with some great views of the Rockies. Now there's many markets that we address. They're not limited to those that you see here on this slide. If you're in attendance or listening on the recording and you do not see your particular market segment here, it doesn't mean that we don't have a solution for you. So please go after the webinar, go to our website, industrial.phase1.com, go to the contact page on the far right, complete the contact information. And in the comments field there, type in your field of interest. Now today, our presentation is gonna cover applications in the following areas, 3D cities, airborne mapping, engineering, environmental, infrastructure planning, and asset inspection. So we're covering quite a few, and some in just one project, and there's other projects that are very specific. Now, the IXM series. The IXM platform for phase one is our workhorse in the industrial group. The IXM series on, on the left, is designed or purpose-built for UAVs. That's available in 50 and 100 megapixel versions, along with five different lens choices. The camera on the right, or the IXMRS, is the camera that we're gonna cover in more detail over the next couple of slides. These specifications on the next two slides that are located on our website, and you can find them again at industrial.phase1.com under products, aerial cameras. For additional detailed information, there is also a download section for detailed technical information about these cameras and their connectivity and um, other uh, CAD and 2D drawing files. The key points on this particular slide, two resolution options, 100 or 150 megapixel, the frame rate, two frames per second, and that is a true frame rate. There's no memory buffering. Our cameras are built for synchronization, as you will see later in this webinar with one of the use cases. 
And as far as weight goes or payload, they're relatively light. We also offer this in a four band configuration for multispectral applications. Now for our lenses, this can probably be overwhelming. We have quite an array of lenses for many applications from 23 millimeters, which not, is not listed here on the spec sheet, um, up to 300 millimeter lens options for our IXMRS cameras. Our RS lenses or reliable shutter lenses come standard with 500,000 activations shutter warranty. So there's no need to fear if you're unsure about which focal length do I use for my application and which camera. We have experts available after this webinar to assist you with pairing up the correct lens to the right resolution for your requirements. And as far as product highlights, I wanted to highlight the 280 megapixel. The 280 megapixel is new to our family. It has a cross track that rivals many large for format cameras on the market when it comes to quality and efficiency of projects on the market today. In fact, if you missed it, we re recently did a webinar on this. It was presented by James Wardlow. It's worth a look if you haven't seen it already. We have these cameras available for delivery now, and this configuration is also available in a four band option. But not limited to the cameras, phase one also offers turnkey solutions. We offer aerial systems. Phase one has taken the best of class products, integrated them around our cameras to offer state-of-the-art acquisition system that is envied by others. We have an entry-level mapping system at 100 megapixel to the best of class 280 megapixel system. We also have dedicated systems sales staff available to help consult with you about the right configuration for your needs. Since this last global crisis we've had over the last couple of months, our systems are in high demand right now. But don't worry, our delivery is quick. We're still averaging a two to four week delivery and in some exceptions, a six week delivery. So um, we can not accommodate uh, those requests. And now for the real reason why you uh, came today or dialed in as far as listening to this webinar, it was all about seeing the applications from the phase one standpoint and who's using them. So um, as I switch over presenters, and I'm really good at multitasking, and I say that with sarcasm, I'm gonna switch to Ron Chapel from Geo One. And Ron's gonna share his screen and then cover for the next 10 minutes or so about how uh, Geo One has used the phase one cameras in multiple configurations for um, different use cases, and then we'll transfer back over to our guest speaker uh, from Geosim. So Ron, your screen looks beautiful. I will let you take it from here. Uh, good morning, Dana and Paula and uh, all the phase one team. Thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, speak today and, and thanks for anyone uh, listening in. Please feel free to, you know, to ask any questions about any part of the presentation. But just a brief introduction. Uh, about Geo One. Geo One is the evolution of our aerial filmworks uh, company that uh, started uh, over 15 years ago doing nature documentary uh, for projects uh, just really all over the world. We we thrive on uh, logistics in extreme locations. Uh, you might see that we have worked uh, from the Arctic uh, to the Amazon. I figure where this is in Lancaster Sound, close to the North Pole, you might as well wear uh, Christmas colors. You can see one of our uh, aerial filming uh, cameras in the background. This was for a film for National Geographic by the name of uh, The Last Ice, which just came out and is at the festival circuit now. Uh, List, brief list of uh, some of the clients that we've worked for, National Geographic, PBS, Discovery, BBC, and what's interesting is now these same companies are calling us not only for aerial cinema, but to do uh, very high-end, uh, high-resolution imaging and LIDAR work. Phase one cameras for us are a strategic component of our sensor integration. We, we build what we would just call a, a sensor pod that has uh, a LiDAR system, an IMU, and a camera at the very minimum in it. 
and then we configure those differently for different types of projects. Now, phase one, because of its reputation for you know, excellent imagery, excellent lenses, and the metric calibration are, are really one of the reasons our clients come to us uh, because of uh, this technology. Uh, for example, this image that you're seeing was 2,500 feet over the uh, active fisher eight uh, in at Kilauea a couple of years ago. And this next screen shows what a one-to-one -one pixel view would look like from 2,500 feet. What's amazing is even though we were this high above the, the volcano, uh, you could still feel that heat moving the aircraft around. And then last year, we followed up with an additional uh, LIDAR and imaging project uh, of the volcano area for a baseline since the, the volcano had become inactive. Uh, what was interesting is as we were flying across the Hale Mau Mau crater, uh, from 1,500 feet, our pilot spotted uh, just a tiny little green flash in the bottom of the uh, of the crater. And again, we're at 1,500 feet over that uh, crater. So as soon as we got back, we were able to find a couple of images that had that in there. And if you look at the very center of the frame, this is what the pilot spotted, and we were able to confirm using the phase one imagery. Uh, that little bit speck of water that's probably not more than six to eight feet wide uh, really created uh, some interest from the scientists. It's the first discovery of water in modern times uh, inside Hale Mau Mau Crater. And now that pond is over 600 feet wide and over 100 feet deep and still growing. We also use phase one cameras for electric utility inspection. Uh, this is a sample again showing the, the full width of the frame at about 450 feet AGL traveling 40 to 50 knots. If you look inside the, the red circle, and I'll go ahead and zoom in again to a one-to-one -one pixel resolution, we can begin to see uh, that that cross arm is threatened by uh, top rot. Very, very critical these days for wildfire mitigation. This is one of our pods. We have we have three different systems. Uh, as I said, they're all configured uh, with a IMU and various phase one cameras. In this case, we have two of the Regal Vux 1LR LiDAR systems that are canted and clocked. Uh, the center camera that you see is a uh, phase 100 megapixel. Uh, for the nadir, and then we have another 100 megapixel at a 45 degree angle forward and one pointed uh, aft. Uh, all of those are connected to an Aplanix uh, IMU on the same uh, optical bench. So we take these sensors and make sure that they're all bolted securely uh, to the same platform so that we can later do the, uh, the offsets. This is the uh, pod that you just saw. Uh, underneath, we have the, the 100 megapixel pointed nadir and the 45 degree angle of a camera pointed aft and then another one pointed forward and the two Regal Vux 1LRs. Uh, this funny looking device here is a Ames 30 Met probe. So we're actually capturing weather data at the same time. Skipped ahead there. Uh, we also have been using the phase one cameras for archeological documentation. This was a really interesting project in the Northern part of Colombia uh, at a, a historic area called Ciudad Perdida. The area that you see in the, in the background in this photograph here uh, was discovered in the 70s and restored uh, to what they thought it looked like. We were down there with uh, Lost Cities uh, looking to s in the jungle with the LIDAR to see if we could find other areas. But at the same time, we we're able to uh, document that area. Uh, this is what it looks like to, to travel on the road. We uh, put all of our gear in cases that are under 32 kilos or 70 pounds so that we can check them as excess baggage. And of course, we're always in hot, uh, dusty places to rig there. 
uh, where this is uh, just a quick picture behind the scenes of where we landed. Uh, you can get to this location either by hiking through the jungle for three days or a 20 minute helicopter ride. Uh, part of the documentation, uh, the helicopter would have been parked in the upper left here. This is uh, again that main platform area at Ciudad Perdida. And the next, this would represent again the full width of the phase one imagery. And then if we zoom in, we can see the incredible detail that is now documented. Uh, really becomes, I mean, particularly with uh, the restrictions on travel and potential earth change and uh, deforestation, it's incredibly important to have this type of imagery for uh, you know, future digital records. And the main project I'd like to talk about and we'll lead into the GeoSim presentation is the data that we collected to build a digital twin uh, for the Hong Kong International Airport. Uh, HKIA is the eighth busiest airport. Uh, you can see to the, the north here that they're building a, another island to add a third runway. Uh, so this, this would look typical uh, flight plan to everyone. It, the flight plan in itself is relatively straightforward to create. Uh, however, it took about six weeks of back and forth with all of the stakeholders to ensure that we could get the highest level of accuracy and meet the safety requirements because, again, it was the active uh, airport. Uh, they had alternately closed runways for us. Uh, the red lines represent acquisition lines at 1,000 feet. Uh, the yellow, we jumped up to 1,500 feet for noise abatement and then tied the data together with these blue crossing lines. Now, a picture of the helicopter with our LIDAR and inside there is uh, a VQ-480 from Regal and a Planix IMU and a four-band uh, phase one system. Uh, our Remote sensing operator, Phil Carter, who is our aerial systems director, uh, as we call it, mowing the lawn over the airport there with the LIDAR and imagery. Uh, the resulting scan that we uh, that was then sent to GeoSim. Uh, kind of our view from the, from the office window here, you can see the uh, new uh, island in the background. And for the imagery part of this, we designed a brand new system that incorporated six phase one cameras uh, looking at five different angles. Uh, so we went from a schematic uh, on the left to the reality on the right. Uh, all the parts are custom made. The cameras in the back here are 100 megapixel four band system and they are all linked to four 150 megapixel cameras, uh, each with a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, the four band had 40 millimeter lenses connected to an AV610. Another behind the scenes of one of our uh, technicians, Gray Mitchell, pulling all of this together. The cameras, of course, are upside down right here. That's just to have easy access to the cabling and just making sure that uh, Everything is daisy chained together and fires uh, at you know the same exact uh, millisecond. The every click created between 700 and 800 megabytes of data. And a picture of the uh, of the pod on the nose of the helicopter. We also uh, went back through having those detailed engineering drawings. We were able to create the offsets between the IMU, uh, the center of the IMU, and the center of each camera so that we had all of those measurements uh, to send uh, to GeoSim for the, uh, to make sure all the cameras were aligned correctly with the data. Uh, quick schematic of those five look angles. Uh, number one is the Nader view. And then two and three were the forward and aft views. Four and five were looking left and looking right. Just grabbing one of the uh, one of the clicks or one of the activations, we can see that Nader view and then the forward, aft, left and right. 
the blue lines represent the overlap between each of the images. Uh, so, for example, the airplane here on the right is actually the same airplane uh, here. And the detail uh, was amazing. So, again, this would represent the full width of the image. And in that pink box there is the detail that we're able to see. We can actually read the numbers on the runway from 1,000 feet. What was also interesting, you can see the incredible detail in the shadows. Uh, they were the airport closed uh, a runway for us every other day. They, you know, they had the north and the south, so we had to uh, be out of the airport by 7:30 a.m. So uh, an unusual time to collect. the The sun came up at about 6:20 a.m. Uh, as soon as it got above the mountains at uh, around 6:30 a.m., we were on station and we had to. Uh, finish that day of acquisition within one hour. Uh, so it was really important to have cameras that had that kind of uh, detail for both the highlights and the shadows. And thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity uh, from the phase one folks, and it was great, uh, you know, partnering with GeoSim. Uh, turn it over to, uh, to Victor. Yes, thank you, Ron, so much. I really like that close up on the lava, even at 2,500 feet. That was amazing. Um, so now we're going to turn the presentation over to uh, Geosim's Dr. Victor Schenker. Uh, just give me a minute, Victor, and we'll get that to you. That should be handed over now. So if you have any questions when it comes to platform configurations, um, please, um, you can contact uh, myself and or Ron uh, Chapel with the, with the uh, Geo1. Uh, to assist in any special or custom configurations when it comes to phase one cameras on a helicopter platform. Okay, Victor, are you ready to roll? Yes, sir. Can you see, we see your screen? screen it looks beautiful. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So thanks again for Dana and, and uh, Ron for inviting me to um, talk about our uh, HKA Digital Twin Project uh, experience. Uh, this whole story started a year and a half ago, I believe, when the, a couple of senior executives from Hong Kong airport uh, visited Israel. We showed them our previous works. We been in the business of being of building high definition, precise, photorealistic looking. 3D models of cities and other high value places for quite some time. Um, I must say there was an immediate click. They told me that you know their vision was to create a digital twin of, of their airport, the purpose being a 3D application platform um, that would be fully integrated with other data storage and processing applications. And the idea was to make this 3D and other associated data instantly available to allow for human-centric visualization and uh, through those to be able to present explainable, predictable future of, of what they wanted to have. Uh, Another uh, idea that is behind this digital twin concept was what they called holistic management and pre precise uh, predictive decision making in four main areas, maintenance, operations, design, and construction, present and future. And uh, finally, to make clear you know, what their purpose was, here is this digital twin system architecture, a 3D model that has links uh, and uh, in hosts 3D applications that are interested to the uh, uh, airport uh, stakeholders that use Unity 3D engine as a visualization and application platform that is also geared and uh, integrated with the GIS and BIM data, operational data, real-time sensors, etc. And all this to serve uh, quite a few 
uh, users and customers, beginning from with the airport management and staff, uh, airport vendors and suppliers, and ending with travelers and visitors and internet users in, in general. And the missing component that uh, they told me they needed to find was somebody who could provide a 3D model of their airport at one centimeter per pixel visual resolution and spatial precision down to few centimeters. So the final spec was better than five centimeters. Um, yeah, we said, yes, we, <laughs> we can do it. So this uh, thing ended very quickly with, with a contract uh, in which our role, as I say, was to supervise the uh, airborne acquisition, both pictures and LiDAR scans, and to conduct our own on the ground uh, scanning. Um, this is this first block of, that you can see on, on the left. We needed to find a uh, really, you know, high accuracy, high precision, excellent quality air data provider. I spoke to the, um, the phase one uh, manager in Israel and he recommended uh, me to Ron. And since then we, we had really very harmonious, very successful collaboration. Then when the data is acquired and properly pre-processed by us, we apply automated geometry uh, modeling that is based on of the shelf products like Bentley uh, uh, reality capture and our own tools and, and procedures, leading eventually to physically based modeling and visualization of, of, of the um, entire airport island, as I said before. Um, here is a more detailed uh, blog diagram of what we do, just you know, to quickly flash in, in front of you the idea. And anybody who is interested in more details, I, I'll save a more detailed presentation for uh, another opportunity. Um, the air data that was collected by Ron and provided to us had really, you know, Super resolution and level of detail, something between two to three centimeter per pixel, out of which we extracted this 3D mesh that you can see. Um, this kind of automated extraction looks really cool when you are uh, at a distance, when but when you come closer, obviously there there are all kinds of distortions and over pixelized uh, uh, details, but for, so for us, this 3D model is not a final product, but rather raw data that we uh, then process and, and improve. The second data layer that uh, we received from Ron was this high density air LiDAR that you can see on, on this image. And we complemented those air, airborne data sets with our own ground data collection, which was a consisted of uh, a car mounted uh, LIDAR, ground LIDAR and a, and a, and a camera. Uh, so the, the first stage in after georeferencing or registration, as we call it, we had the, all those air and ground data uh, layers fused together, which I represent here. And after having all, all the data fused and available, we start our uh, unique 3D modeling process. Part of it was a uh, production of very high spatial accuracy, uh, DEM, digital elevation model. And what you see here is the entire uh, HKAI uh, island uh, DEM with spatial accuracy better than five centimeters. I think that it's quite an unprecedented production. Uh, you know, with all the modesty, I, I must say that I haven't seen any similar product 
you know, produced at this scale and spatial uh, uh, resolution and, and the one that I'm showing you. Then let me show you a couple of uh, uh, screenshots of our reality model that was the final destination of our work. Let me start with this Bentley product that when we came to the scene, uh, the Hong Kong airport uh, commissioned and, and produced. That's how the, you know, the close-up look scene looks, not, not very uh, exciting. And the very same scene with our model. And you obviously can <laughs> see the difference. A few uh, more screenshots you know, airplane models with all the ground equipment uh, sitting next to the terminal, uh, midfield terminal, um, the terminal one shown from the uh, service road with all the very fine details that you can see in the picture properly uh, captured and recreated. Um, another shot of a uh, the the uh, uh, skyway and the ground equipment and all this is fully interactive can be put online can be uh, navigated and visualized in in real time and also uh, integrated with as I said before other data bases and and 3D applications um, this is where this whole project is going to go. Few words to uh, finish about ourselves. Okay, the management and R&D center uh, are in Tel Aviv. Uh, we have a small office in Vancouver, Canada, and a production center is in India and Poland. Uh, most of our work was uh, focused on doing uh, virtual cities. Uh, Philadelphia, more recently Vancouver in Canada. We've done a couple of the university campuses and um, other commercial projects. Um, this is very briefly my part. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Victor. I really appreciated that presentation. That is an amazing end deliverable. I not only appreciated the uh, the detail and the images at a thousand feet, but I also um, appreciated the how that data was transformed into a virtual world, and that was extremely impressive. Victor, I'm sure there's many asset owners calling you right now to transfer their um, asset properties into this virtual world. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> we are here to serve, you know, any interested customers. Yes. Sir. Thank you. So um, now is our, when, and again, just to finalize on this, this is a great example of how phase one cameras are an integral part from the acquisition side to create that virtual or digital twin of a major airport. Um, this is now the part of the section where if you've had some questions that you can chat, have chatted those into the the window and submitted those to Paula, our moderator. Um, if you haven't had any questions and you would like to, um, they come up later after this is over, you can always send it to my email address, that's dbr at phase1.com. And I'll go ahead and turn this over to Paula to see, Paula, do we have some questions to answer for the moment? There's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one was why were 150 megapixel used for the obliques and can an oblique system be built with 100 megapixel instead? Ron, that is that Ron? Um, yep, no, Paul, I can answer that. Uh, just to, uh, to repeat, the question is, can uh, 100 megapixel cameras be used for obliques instead of the 150s? Is is yes. that correct? Yep. Yeah. That's uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so you could use the really any of the phase one products depending on the requirements. Um, we we chose the the 100 uh, for the Nader quite quite frankly because we already you know had it uh, in stock and in use, and we used the 150s because the the distance from the uh, for an oblique camera uh, is further than the Nader, 
and we wanted to be able to have the higher resolution for the or, or for the oblique angles to match the resolution at a, a sort of a center point average with the nadir. Uh, so that was the reason we we switched to the 150s and a slightly longer lens for the obliques. But you could certainly uh, build that with any of the phase one cameras. The sweet spot for us seemed to be that that 100, 150 mix with a 40 millimeter for the nadir and a 50 millimeter for the oblique. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's another one that says, um, I think it's for Victor, it looks like you merged different cameras. How did the phase one compare to the others? Um, could you repeat the question again? Sure. It looks like you merged different cameras. How did the phase one compare to the others? Um, well, you know, phase one being an area of uh, airborne sensor has obviously lower resolution than the, you know, camera that we had on the rooftop of a car that shoots it from a distance of uh, 10, 15 meters. Uh, so the the idea here is that the uh, uh, the aerial cameras are giving us the geometry, okay, and the uh, a source also of the uh, textures for upper uh, floors and and rooftops, and we use the ground camera uh, that we have on the car to do the details, both geometry and textures of the facades of buildings, uh, fine details of the strip of the uh, road surface uh, culture and so forth. So the, 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 this is the split of, uh, of, uh, of the usage of airborne versus ground uh, camera applications. Thanks, Victor. Um, that's all the questions that I've got at the moment, Dana. So I'll hand back over to you. Over to you. Excellent. Oh, hold on. Thank Might just be you. one just come in actually. Okay. Can can GeoSim achieve equivalent reconstruction performance from only lidar data? No, uh, because the lidar data gives you uh, geometry only. Um, and we and the idea of those reality models is that you uh, paste on top of a high definition geometry uh, textural information, texture maps, and texture maps uh, have to come from a photographic source. So lidar is good to create what we call box model, but to have a, a you know full uh, a photorealism texture maps have to come from the, uh, the photo cameras. Sure, thank you. Yep, that, that, that's all the questions, Dana. I'll hand okay. back over to you. Thank you, Paula, and uh, thank you, Victor and Ron. This has been a very informative uh, webinar. If for those of you that uh, have seen this and there is someone you can think of that see, man, this person really needs to take a look at this webinar. It is recorded. It will be available on our website in the next couple of days under webinar. Please go to industrial.phase1.com. Go to our webinar section, and there's a long list of them, and this will be one of those that are posted in the next couple of days. Uh, please share that with uh, those that you feel may be of interest. And for any other questions not related to maybe this webinar or other Phase 1 type products, configurations, my contact information is below as well so for you to um, to call back uh, to, at a later time. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.